Let's spend some time talking about Baphomet. It's an important concept in Western Hermetic magic. Those of us who are members of Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica explicitly profess belief in it. The EGC Creed, which we recite at the beginning of every Gnostic Mass, calls out Baphomet in its third clause. And I believe in the serpent and the lion, mystery of mystery, in his name Baphomet. But wait, we said what now? A serpent? and a lion, which are named Baphomet. What does that mean? That's a discussion that could go on for hours all by itself, but here's a hint. It's a mystery. When the average person in our culture thinks of Baphomet, they imagine something similar to this, the statue placed in various locations by the Satanic Temple as a thumb-in-the-eye retort to governmental support of Christian values. Is that right? Is Baphomet the adversary of Christianity, that is, what they would call Satan or the devil? And are those of us who profess to believe in Baphomet all devil worshippers? Well, no. But to prove that, we need to figure out what Baphomet does represent. Let's start with some history. There have been references to Baphomet for somewhere around a thousand years. The earliest reference I know of to that name appears in a letter by the crusader Anselm of Ribemont, dated July of 1098, where he writes in Latin, As the next day dawned, they called loudly upon Baphomet, and we prayed silently in our hearts to God, then we attacked and forced all of them outside the city walls. That's from the First Crusade, which happened in the years 1096 to 1099. Raymond de Vaguilaire, a chronicler of the First Crusade, reports that the troubadours used the term Baphomet for the Islamic prophet Muhammad and called the mosques Baphomarias, as reported by Joseph-François Michaud in his History of the Crusades. Raimundus de Agiles says of the Mohammedans, In ecclesias autem magnus Baphomarius faciebant, habebant monticulum ubi duae erant Baphomariae. The troubadours employ Baphomaria for mosque and Baphomet for Muhammad. The name Baphomet appears again around 1195, after the Third but before the Fourth Crusade, in a poem written in Occitan, which was a language spoken from southern France to northern Spain. It's by a troubadour who calls himself Gavodan, and is named Señores Pelos Nostres Picats, or Gentlemen for Our Sins. It includes these lines, Gavodan shall be a prophet, for his word shall become a fact. Death to those dogs! God shall be honored and worshipped where Mohammed is now served. Those are all generally accepted as explicit references to Mohammed and to Mohammedans, so the title Baphomet seems pretty clearly to be a medieval French corruption of the prophet Mohammed. And there's more in that vein. Around 1250, a poem bewailing the defeat of the Seventh Crusade, written by Astarque de Arlach, refers to Baphomet. De Baphomet is also the title of one of four surviving chapters of an Occitan translation of Ramon Lull's earliest known work, the Libre de la Doctrina Pueril, or Book on the Instruction of Children. But, in 1307, when King Philip IV of France arrested Jacques de Molay and scores of other Knights Templar, the Templars were accused of, among other things, idolatry, and were suspected of worshipping either a mummified severed head, which might have been John the Baptist, or a figure known as Baphomet. That charge was one among many. The Templars were accused of quite a variety of things, homosexuality, incest, spitting on the cross, and other such offenses, which many of them confessed to after sufficient um, persuasion on the part of their inquisitors. These confessions led to many Templars being burned at the stake, including the current Grand Master of the Order, Jacques de Molay. However, most, if not all, of the charges were dubious, They were the same charges that were leveled against the Cathars and against many of King Philip IV of France's enemies. In fact, 
Philip had earlier kidnapped Pope Boniface VIII and charged him with nearly identical offenses. So we can't really say what the truth of the matter was, which is not to say that it stopped people from trying. In 1818, the Viennese Orientalist Joseph Freiherr von Hammerpurgstall published an essay specifically identifying Baphomet as a Templar idol. He provided several images, such as this one, or this one, which he identified as the Templar's Baphometic idol. His essay has a very impressive title, which translates into English as Discovery of the Mystery of Baphomet, by which the Knights Templar, like the Gnostics and Ophites, are convicted of apostasy, of idolatry, and of moral impurity by their own monuments. However, as with the charges by which the Templars were originally convicted, there's a little problem. Von Hammer appears to have taken his archaeological evidence from Baphomets that were faked by earlier scholars, and to have used literary evidence such as the Grail Romances to claim that the Templars were Gnostics, and the Templars' head was a Gnostic idol called Baphomet. The Baphomet article in an 1851 edition of Encyclopedia Americana says this about von Hammer's claims. His chief subject is the images which are called Baphomet, found in several museums and collections of antiquities, as in Weimar and in the Imperial Cabinet in Vienna. These little images are of stone, partly hermaphrodites, having generally two heads or two faces with a beard, but in other respects female figures, most of them accompanied by serpents, the sun and moon, and other strange emblems, and bearing many inscriptions mostly in Arabic. The inscriptions he reduces almost all to mete, which is, according to him, not the metis of the Greeks, but the Sophia Achamot Prunichos of the Ophites, which was represented half man, half woman, as the symbol of wisdom, unnatural voluptuousness, and the principle of sensuality. He asserts that those small figures are such as the Templars, according to the statement of a witness, carried with them in their coffers. Baphomet signifies Baphometheos, baptism of Metis, baptism of fire, or the Gnostic baptism, an enlightening of the mind which, however, was interpreted by the Ophites in an obscene sense as fleshly union. The fundamental assertion that those idols and cups came from the Templars has been considered as unfounded, especially as the images known to have existed among the Templars seem rather to be images of saints. By the way, Achamot Prunikos is the so-called fallen Sophia, wisdom trapped in matter. Achamot is Hebrew for wisdom, thus referring to Sophia, and Prunikos is Greek for principle. The Ophites were members of a Christian Gnostic sect depicted by Hippolytus of Rome in a work called the Syntagma, or Arrangement, which, unfortunately, was lost. So, where does this leave us? Look at what's not being said. In what we've seen so far, no one has claimed that Baphomet is the devil. An idol, yes. A heathen image, yes. A corruption of the name of a non-Christian prophet, and therefore an enemy of Christ, yes. But no biblical adversary of God. Sorry, not seeing it. On the other hand, what is being claimed is that Baphomet represents things other than simply an old French corruption of Mohammed. Von Hammer took his theories in large part from the work of Christoph Friedrich Nicolai, who was part of an 18th century fad that sought to tie the Knights Templar with the origins of Freemasonry. A 1782 book by Nicolai claimed that the Templars were Gnostics and also made the claim that Baphomet was derived from Baphometus, which you'll also occasionally find rendered this way. The figure eight looking character that you can see second from the right is a ligature of Epsilon and Omicron that was used frequently in Byzantine manuscripts. Von Hammer says that this phrase means Tafe der Weisheit, which is to say, baptism of wisdom. The French dramatist and linguist Francois Renoir says that Nikolai attached to it the idea of the image of the supreme god in the state of quietude attributed to him by the Manichaean Gnostics, and supposed that the Templars had a secret doctrine and initiations of several grades which the Saracens had communicated to them. There are others. In a 1965 book, Pierre Klosowski reported that the Baphomet has diverse etymologies. The three phonemes that constitute the denomination are also said to signify, in coded fashion, Basileus Philosophorum Metalloricum, the sovereign of metallurgical philosophers, that is, of the alchemical laboratories that were supposedly established in various chapters of the temple. 
The androgynous nature of the figure apparently goes back to the Adam Kadmon of the Chaldeans, which one finds in the Zohar. Von Hammer further identifies Baphemethos with Metis, a titaness in Greek mythology who was also the goddess of wisdom. But apparently not satisfied with only one explanation, Von Hammer also says that Baphomet is from Mafta Bet Hashem, which means key to the house of God. Here I want to note that his pronunciation is a little bit off. Mafta should actually be pronounced Maftecha. Rudolf Raspe claims that Baphomet is the Greek Baphemetros or Baphemetios, the baptism or tincture of wisdom. I found this reference as a notation in a section titled Egyptian Hieroglyphics from a book published 1791. At their reception or initiation into the highest degree of their order, they received Baphemetheos, that is to say, the baptism or tincture of wisdom. They were presented with a sign or symbol of this baptism, which was the Pentagon of Pythagoras, and they worshipped a kind of image idol, which, like the Abraxas on this gem, was a figure of a bearded old man, or rather the representation of the only supreme being which they admitted and professed. By the way, perhaps a little bit off topic, Raspe is the author of a charming little book titled The Surprising Adventures of Baron Munchausen, which Terry Gilliam made into a movie in 1988. Highly recommended. H.P. Blavatsky, a co-founder of the Theosophical Society, calls Baphomet a symbol of Azazel, the goat of God or strength of God, the ancient Hebrew scapegoat. Biblically, the name Azazel represents a desolate place where a scapegoat bearing the sins of the Jews was sent during Yom Kippur. Hugh J. Schoenfield, one of the scholars who worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls, wrote a book called The Essene Odyssey that repeats a claim also made previously by other researchers that the word Baphomet was created Kabbalistically via the Atbash substitution cipher. Explaining this involves diving deeply into Kabbalistic es- esoterica, and it, it can be kind of confusing, so let's go through it a little bit at a time. Atbash substitutes the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet for the last, the second for the second last, and so on. Here on the screen, you can see that Aleph Bet is written right to left at the top and left to right below that, so that you can see how the substitutions line up with each other. Baphomet, rendered in Hebrew, is more or less this way, though it's useful to note that in this case, Baphomet is spelt appropriately according to the way it might have been rendered in Hebrew, which is not the way Western Hermetic magicians would normally transliterate it. That would look more in the order of this. However, Going back to the suggested spelling, when we run that through our Atbash encoder, Bet becomes Shin, Pe becomes Vav, Vav becomes Pe, Mem becomes Yud, and Tov becomes Aleph, yielding a Hebrew transliteration of the Greek word Sophia, that is, wisdom. So far, with a few outliers, authors have been converging on the idea of Baphomet as being wisdom in various guises, particularly as a baptism and as the Gnostic Sophia. But now we find the sage set to introduce one more major influence in Western Hermetic thought. Let's back up to the middle of the 1800s, where we find a very enthusiastic and, one might say, inventive French aficionado of magic. Meet Monsieur Alphonse-Louis Constant, more commonly known to the Western world as Eliphas Levy. Since 1856, the name Baphomet has been associated with Levy's sabbatic goat image. As you can see, this contains binary images representing Levy's symbolization of the equilibrium of opposites. That is, it's half-human and half-animal, male and female, good and evil, on and off, other such things. Drawing in part on the images published by von Hammer, Levy depicted Baphomet as a winged, goat-headed being, with human female breasts and a caduceus for a phallus, seated on a cubic stone which rests on a globe, with its right arm raised toward a waxing crescent moon and inscribed Solve, its left arm lowered toward a waning crescent moon and inscribed Coagula, a flaming torch between its horns, and an upright pentagram on its forehead. On the one hand, Levy's intention was to symbolize his concept of balance that was essential to his magnetistic notion of the astral light, On the other hand, the Baphomet represents a tradition that he thought should result in a perfect social order. 
this image pretty quickly became the standard picture of Baphomet. In Levy's Transcendental Magic, which is where it first appeared, it was only captioned as the Sabbatic Goat, but that text does explicitly identify it as Baphomet in this passage. Two things, as we have shown, are necessary for the acquisition of magical power, the emancipation of will from servitude and its instruction in the art of domination. The sovereign will is represented in our symbols by the woman who crushes the serpent's head and by the radiant angel who restrains and constrains the dragon with lance and heel. In this place, let us affirm without evasion that the great magical agent, the double current of light, the living and astral fire of the earth, was represented by the serpent with the head of an ox, goat, or dog in ancient Theogenes. It is the dual serpent of the Caduceus, the old serpent of Genesis, but it is also the brazen serpent of Moses twined about the Tao, that is, the generating lingam. It is, moreover, the goat of the Sabbath and the Baphomet of the Templars. It is the hyle of the Gnostics. It is the double tail of the serpent which forms the legs of the solar cock of Abraxas. Levy also created this tetragrammaton pentagram, symbolizing his view of the microcosm or human being that incorporates much of the same symbolism as his sabbatic goat regarding his e equilibrium of opposites and alchemical references. Not being one to shy away from a little bit of sensationalism, Levy also informs us that the so-called upright pentagram is good, whereas the inverted pentagram is evil, which I think may have been just a little bit unfortunate because of the associations the inverted pentagram came to have. As it is said, the devil is in the details. With that, Let's take a moment to summarize what our various sources have said about what Baphomet represents. We've seen that Baphomet is an old French corruption of Mohammed. Actually, even though this is likely how the concept of Baphomet got started, I'm going to ignore this reference for the rest of this talk, since recent thought has generally wandered away from that. Instead, I'm going to talk about Baphomet as wisdom in various guises, including the baptism of wisdom and Sophia the alchemical principle Basileus Philosophorum Metalloricum, the key of the house of God, and the equilibrium of opposites. We'll take these, not in the order that I've listed them, but in a way that I hope will begin to tell a coherent story. Let's start with the equilibrium of opposites, which is also called the unity of opposites. The idea of equilibrating or unifying opposites has fascinated Western thought for well over 2,500 years. Heraclitus of Ephesus, who was a pre-Socratic Ionian Greek philosopher, made that a tenet of his philosophy. It's one of the three doctrines for which he's best known. But even before his time, philosophers had been contemplating the notion of opposites. Earlier pre-Socratics, such as Heraclitus' predecessor, Anaximander, posited that every element was an opposite or connected to an opposite. For instance, water is cold, fire is hot, water is wet, fire is dry, Thus, they said, the material world was composed of some indefinite, boundless apeiron from which arose the elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and the pairs of opposites, hot and cold, wet and dry. According to Anaximander, there was a continual war of opposites. As postulated by Anaximander, apeiron is the unlimited, indeterminate, and indefinite ground, origin, or primal principle of all matter, that is, basically the same thing that the later Gnostics would call Heil. This apeiron was an arche, something that was in the beginning, a, a, a first principle, which to Anaximander was a substance or a primal element. Now, Anaximander's student and successor, Anaximenes of Miletus, replaced this indefinite boundless arche with air that was a known element with neutral properties. According to Anaximenes, there wasn't so much a war of opposites as a continuum of change. Heraclitus didn't accept this Milesian monism. He replaced their underlying material arche with a single divine law of the universe, which he called logos. To Heraclitus, the universe is in constant change, but also remaining the same. An object can move from point A to point B, thus creating a change, but the underlying law remains the same. 
Thus, a unity of opposites is present in the universe as difference and sameness. One of Heraclitus' aphorisms is, the road up and the road down are the same thing. This is an example of something called a compresent unity of opposites. The slanted road has simultaneously the opposite qualities of ascent and descent. According to Heraclitus, everything is in constant flux, and every changing object coinstantiates at least one pair of opposites, though not necessarily simultaneously. And every pair of opposites is coinstantiated in at least one object. Heraclitus also uses the succession of opposites as his basis for change. For example, cold things grow hot, a hot thing cold, a moist thing withers, a parched thing is wetted. Or this, as a single object persists through opposite properties, this object undergoes change. So, if I may summarize briefly, Heraclitus posits an all-encompassing logos which, while unchanging, simultaneously is in a constant state of change. It strikes me that his basic philosophy boils down to the more things change, the more they stay the same. Of course, I should also note that the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers were hardly the first to think up the idea of opposing forces in a state of tension and flux with one another. It might also have been considered by other systems of thought. So, unity of opposites. This unity of opposites, a, a situation in which the existence or identity of a thing or a situation depends on the coexistence of at least two conditions which are opposite to each other, yet which depend on each other and presuppose each other, is a central theme of dialectics. Dialecticians claim that unity or identity of opposites can exist in reality or in thought. If the opposites were completely balanced, the result would be stasis. Yet, rather than stasis, because there is unity within their duality, the identity of opposites is taken to be the instance of their very manifestation. The unity between them is the essential principle of making any particular opposite in question extant as either opposing force. For example, upward can't exist unless there's a downward. They are opposites, but they coinstantiate one another. Their unity is that either one exists because its opposite is necessary for the, the, the existence of the other. So one manifests immediately with the other. Hot wouldn't be hot without cold. There'd be no contrast by which to define it as hot relative to any other condition, so it would not and could not exist if not for its opposite that fulfills the necessary prerequisite existence for the opposing condition to be. Either one's identity is the contraposing principle itself that necessitates the other. The criteria for what is opposite is something therefore a priori, that is to say, without predecessor. However, these opposites as posited aren't the complete story. They are not contrapositives of each other, any more than the north and south poles of a magnetic field represent everything in between, or represent those things that can't be magnetized. For this, we require a broader, perhaps a different understanding of those principles. So, rather than the simple unity of opposites, we need a different model of dialectic. Within Hegelianism, the word dialectic has the specialized meaning of a contradiction between ideas that serves as the determining factor in their relationship. Here, dialectic comprises three stages of development. First, a thesis or a statement of an idea, which gives rise to a second step, a reaction or antithesis that contradicts or negates the thesis. And third, the synthesis, a statement through which the differences between the two points are resolved. There are places where the binary unity of opposites works just fine. For example, isness and not isness. A thing moves or it doesn't move. For all practical purposes, there exists no in-between. But we're going to augment that model for cases that posit thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Oh, um, about this image. The assignations that you see on that picture are my own personal thesis, levity, and its antithesis, gravity. Their unifying principle is, of course, zen. And if you're old enough ever to have seen Disney's Cinderella, try this. Put them together and what do you got? Levity, gravity, zen. You're welcome. However, returning more or less to real life, that's approximately analogous to what we see happening on the Tree of Life, where the energy originating from Keter that Chochmah broadcasts without interpretation is restricted, organized, and reformulated by Bina before being sent onward. After the turbulence settles, the next balanced result of that is Teferit, 
which is to say, Baphomet, who sits at the visible root of the pillar of balance, the element of air. To understand what I mean by that statement, let's take a moment to talk about the Tree of Life and Kabbalah, the system it describes. To a certain extent, it's organized and informed by the ancient Hebrew idea that there are only three elements, fire, water, and air. Those in turn combine to form the earth that we know. But those elements are themselves the product of other influences, all of which are organized around the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav heh Predecessor systems of our Kabbalah assert that the unique letters in turn emit the so-called mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Shin, as follows. Yud emits the mother letter Shin, which is the essence of fire. He emits the mother letter Mem, which is the essence of water. Vav emits the mother letter Aleph, which is the essence of air. These are grouped into three pillars. On the right, mercy. On the left, severity, also called justice. And between them, the rectifying influence of balance. In older manuscripts, you'll also see balance referred to as mildness. So we're watching the pillars of the tree become the stages of our dialectic. Mercy is thesis. Severity is antithesis. And balance is synthesis. Further, they have alchemical properties. These are the alchemical tria prima, the three primes, sulfur, salt, and mercury, which are also viewed as spirit, body, and soul. Hold on to that thought. Alchemy is a topic we'll visit in more detail shortly. Before I go on, I need to invoke an authority I haven't quoted yet. Some of you might have noticed that so far we haven't heard from this guy, Alistair Crowley. Well, it's finally his turn. In a project that began in Mexico in 1900 and finally completed in Algeria at the end of 1909, Crowley scribed the 30 so-called Enochian ethers described by John Dee and Edward Kelly. During the course of that work, Crowley identified places on the Tree of Life as belonging to entities that are significant to our story. In particular, I want to call out these. On the right is Chaos, which Crowley places at Chochmah, the top sephira of the Pillar of Mercy. It's essentially our thesis, broadcasting wholesale the influence it receives from the highest sephira, Kether. Then on the left is Babylon, which Crowley places at Bina, the top sephira of the Pillar of Severity. It's our antithesis, which receives, restricts, and focuses the influence before sending it on. Finally, in the middle is, drumroll please, our old friend Baphomet, our synthesis. Crowley places him at Teferit, the center of the Tree of Life. Teferit is, as I mentioned earlier, the visible top of the central pillar of balance. The absolute highest sephira of that pillar is Kether, the crown, but it's extremely difficult to see from down where we currently are. There's a lot of noise in the way, including Teferit itself, which shines brightly as a representative of that absolute source. There are a lot more correspondences, but this is as far as I intend to go with them today, except for one addendum. Before we move along, I want to present a bit of speculation for you to consider. In order to do that, I need to introduce an alternate name for Tetragrammaton, Iao. This name is found in many places as an alternate name for the Most High. It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in fragments of copies of the Septuagint, which was a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. It's in many other manuscript sources from around the time when Christianity was busy becoming a thing. It was in common use among the early Gnostics. Scholars suggest that it's one way of vocalizing the yod heh vav of the Tetragrammaton that we've just been considering. And it has some maybe interesting connotations when we turn again to Aleister Crowley. In Chapter 7 of Crowley's book, Magic and Theory in Practice, he spends some time considering the Sanskrit word aum. He says, A is the negative, and also the unity which concentrates it into a positive form. A is the Holy Spirit who begets God in flesh upon the Virgin, according to the formula familiar to students of the Golden Bough. A is also the babe in the egg, thus produced. The quality of A is thus bisexual. It is the original being, Zeus Arenathelus, Bacchus Diphues, or Baphomet. Well, if that works for the A in Aum, why shouldn't it also work for the A in Iao? If we apply that principle, what do we see? Here's a suggestion. I is our thesis. It's the cosmic progenitor sending its influence forth. O is our antithesis. It's the womb that receives that influence, restricts it, and focuses it before sending it on. Finally, A is our synthesis. 
the balanced result of the alchemical processes that created it, and which is also the embodiment of that process, that is to say, Baphomet. So, alchemy. I've said several times that Baphomet is not just the result of an alchemical process, but an embodiment of that process. This is in Baphomet's nature as the unity of opposites. To see this, we look at the tarot and at the tree of life. The tarot assignations and images we'll be using are Crowley's in his Thoth Tarot. We'll begin by looking at Trump 6, The Lovers. In Crowley's explanation of his tarot, called The Book of Thoth, he writes about the lovers that this card and its twin, 14, art, are the most obscure and difficult of the Atu. Each of these symbols is in itself double, so that the meanings form a divergent series, and the integration of the card can only be regained by repeated marriages, identifications, and some form of hermaphroditism. He goes on, Yet the attribution is the essence of simplicity. Atu 6 refers to Gemini, ruled by Mercury. It means the twins. The Hebrew letter corresponding is Zion, which means a sword, and the framework of the card is therefore the arch of swords beneath which the royal marriage takes place. The sword is primarily an engine of division. In the intellectual world, which is the world of the sword suit, it represents analysis. This card and Atu 14 together compose the comprehensive alchemical maxim Solve et Coagula. Turning to what Crowley just said was the twin of the lovers, Atu 14, art, Crowley writes, this card is the complement and the fulfillment of Atu 6, Gemini. It pertains to Sagittarius, the opposite to Gemini in the Zodiac, and therefore, after another manner, one with it. Sagittarius means the archer, and the card is, in its simplest and most primitive form, a picture of Diana the Huntress. And this. This card represents the consummation of the royal marriage which took place in Atu 6. The black and white personages are now united in a single androgyne figure, even the bees and the serpents on their robes have made an alliance. The red lion has become white and increased in size and importance, while the white eagle, similarly expanded, has become red. He has exchanged his red blood for her white gluten. Of course, being Crowley, the next thing he says is, it is impossible to explain these terms to any but advanced students of alchemy. Well, gosh, thanks, Al. But, assuming that by these terms he means the red blood and white gluten, those are in fact a lecture that I'm not qualified to give. I admit that rarely stops me from trying, but this is going to be one of those rare instances. Instead, I'll talk about these two cards, the lovers and art, and how they figure into the alchemical operation. Let's look at them in their context in the Tree of Life. Here's the part of the tree we'll be using for this demonstration. It shows the Sephiroth, also called spheres, as circles with their names in Hebrew and English, plus the paths connecting those Sephiroth as they are taught in Western Hermetic tradition. The paths, in turn, are shown with the Hebrew letters assigned to those paths in Western Hermetic tradition, plus numbers showing the order of the paths. The colors shown for each part are given by the Golden Dawn, which was an esoteric society that initiated Crowley and gave him his initial training in Kabbalah and Tarot. Um, I say was. The Golden Dawn continues to exist and to, even to thrive, even to this day. So, anyway, we've already seen that the vertical groupings in this picture are the pillars of mercy on the right, severity on the left, and balance between them. We've also said that in our dialectic, these are our thesis, fire, our antithesis, water, and our synthesis, air. Now watch while we add those two tarot trumps. The path Zion connects Bina with Tiferet. It's the path assigned to the lovers. The path Samech connects Tiferet with Yesud. It's the path assigned to Art. Do you see what this tells us about Tiferet? We established it as our synthesis, the outcome of our dialectic. That dialectic is itself a form of alchemical operation, but here we see that Tiferet sits at the center of an alchemical operation. I submit for your consideration that both those things are simultaneously true. This is a dichotomy, which is thus a thesis and antithesis, opposites that must be unified through a new synthesis. Moreover, after you've done that, you'll find that the same is true of your new synthesis. There is no conclusion, only a fresh set of questions. That's part of the perpetual change that Heraclitus found in the Logos, which was simultaneously true with its unchangeableness. 
Here, I remind us all that Baphomet is the synthesis that is Tiferet. So I think that dichotomy might well be part of the essence of Baphomet. Backing up a half step, I keep mentioning an alchemical operation. Here I'll pose the question, what is that operation? For clues, we can take another look at Crowley's A214 art. Specifically, we want to see the writing that surrounds the main figure. That's a formula for accomplishing the solve et coagula instruction we saw written on Baphomet's arms. The writing in the art card says, Visita interiora terrae rectificando invenis occultum lapidem. Translated into English, this means, Visit the interior parts of the earth. By rectification you will find the hidden stone. The Latin itself is actually an acrostic. The initial letters of its name spell something significant. Looking at those letters, we find this. Those initial letters spell vitriol, a substance that was quite significant to the early alchemists. The word vitriol comes from the Latin word vitriolum, meaning glassy. Vitriol, with no further qualifications, generally means sulfuric acid, which resembles glass when you concentrate it to its viscous form. The traditional name for sulfuric acid is, in fact, oil of vitriol. Making sulfuric acid relied on heating naturally occurring minerals composed of sulfates. These minerals are quite colorful and different enough that they got various names. Copper sulfate, for example, is known as blue vitriol, while zinc sulfate is white vitriol, iron sulfate is green vitriol, and cobalt sulfate is red vitriol. When they're heated, all these compounds convert to their oxide and give off water along with sulfur trioxide, which then combine to form sulfuric acid. So that you can get an idea of what the alchemists were seeing, here's an example of cupric sulfate, copper sulfate, which is blue vitriol. Alchemists wanted vitriol because it dissolves things, the solve part of solve et coagula. In particular, they worked with seven metals, which they also associated with the seven planets that were part of their astrology. Lead, which they associated with Saturn. Tin, associated with Jupiter. Iron, associated with Mars. Copper, associated with Venus. Mercury, associated with the Mercury. Silver, associated with the Moon. And gold, associated with the Sun. Each of these planets also has its associated day of the week. And quite by chance, of course, there are seven letters in the word vitriol, which just happen to line up with the seven metals, their planets, and their corresponding days of the week. And again, entirely coincidentally, there's an alchemical operation of seven stages. That operation goes like this. The first stage is calcination. You heat a substance in a crucible over an open flame until it's reduced to ashes. Quoting from the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus, the alchemists say about this that its father is the sun. The second stage is dissolution. Dissolve the ashes from calcination in water. About this it is said, its mother is the moon. The third stage is separation. Isolate the components of dissolution by filtration, then discard any ungenuine or unworthy material. About this it is said, the wind carries it in its belly. The fourth stage is conjunction. Recombine the saved elements from separation into a new substance. About this, it is said, the earth is its nurse. The fifth stage is fermentation, which is the two-step process that begins with putrefying of the hermaphroditic child from the conjunction, which results in its death and resurrection to a new level of being. The fermentation phase then begins with the introduction of new life into the product of conjunction to strengthen it and ensure its survival. About this, it is said, separate the earth from fire, the subtle from the gross, gently and with great ingenuity. The sixth stage is distillation. Boil and condense the fermented solution to increase its purity. The same thing you do when you distill wine to make brandy. About this, it is said, it rises from earth to heaven and descends again to earth, thereby combining within itself the powers of both the above and the below. The final stage is coagulation. Precipitate or sublimate the purified ferment from distillation. About this, it is said, thus will you obtain the glory of the whole universe. All obscurity will be clear to you. 
This is the greatest force of all powers because it overcomes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. So the essence of the operation becomes clear. We're transmuting lead into gold. Specifically, we're converting the lead of Saturn, which is Bina, Babylon, which is the antithesis of our thesis, Chokhmah, chaos, into the gold of Tiferet, which is the synthesis of Baphomet. By the way, I should point out that vitriol the chemical, that is, sulfuric acid, will dissolve all the alchemical metals except gold. The essence of alchemy and of the alchemical process is that gold is what's left after you've dissolved everything else. Ponder that. Before I move on, there's one bit of wild speculation I'd like to toss out for consideration. As long as we're counting by sevens, there's a seven I haven't mentioned yet. Recall that the two tarot trumps that bracket this operation are Atu-6, the lovers, and Atu-14, art. As luck would have it, there are seven trumps between these two. There's Atu-7, the chariot, Atu-8, adjustment, Atu-9, the hermit, Atu-10, fortune, Atu-11, lust, 12, the hanged man, and 13, death. Might it be possible that these cards in some way relate to the vitriol formula? I don't propose to try to answer that here, but if you happen to have some spare time, you might want to ponder the question. Regarding the formula of vitriol, here's a schematic picture of the formula that you might find useful. This was included in a book called Theatrum Chimicum, printed in 1614 by an alchemist named Stolzius von Zulzenberg. I'll note before we start that some of the symbology in this image disagrees with what I laid out earlier. For example, the assignation of the three primes, body, soul, and spirit. So you're free to decide for yourself which analysis you prefer. Rather than trying to analyze this picture for you, I'm going to repeat what the website alchemicalpsychology.com has to say about Stolzius' image. They say, This alchemical mandala is used as a teaching device in much the same way that Tibetans used yantras. By meditating on this image, the initiate brings together in his mind the recipe vitriol, the symbolic powers of numbers 1 through 7, and many astrological and mythological signs. At the very center of the picture is the face of an alchemist. This places him at the point of totality, the place where things arise and return to his consciousness. One is the symbol of identity. Out of the one issues the archetypal pair of royal opposites, the solar king of masculine consciousness and the solar queen of feminine consciousness. Each can be seen on either side of the diagram. The king sits on the back of a lion and the queen sits on the back of a whale or dolphin. The elements of earth and water are shown as the mountain beneath the lion and the water from which the giant fish emerges. The large inverted triangle outside the main circle indicates the realms of body, soul, and spirit. Body is at the very bottom, represented by the cube of earth surrounded by five planets. Soul, or anima, is positioned in the upper left-hand angle accompanied by an image of the sun, and spirit is in the right angle above a picture of the moon. The earth and water elements that compose the bottom of the picture are completed with the salamander, the elemental creature of fire, and a bird symbolizing air in the right-hand corner. Thus we have all four elements represented. The alchemist's body presents us with five elements. His left foot is in the water, his right on the earth. His left hand holds a feather indicating air and his right hand is shown with a torch, fire. Finally, above the alchemist's face, at the very top of the diagram, is a pair of outstretched wings. These represent the ultimate spirit, or quintessence. The number six is found in a combination of two triangles, one drawn directly on the alchemist's face, and the other as the larger triangle that we already described earlier. The inner triangle represents salt, which corresponds to the cube of Earth. Sulfur relates to the solar forces, and mercury, in this case, refers to the lunar spirit. And so we approach the end of our meandering journey. But there are questions left unanswered. For example, the vitriol formula is, visit the interior of the earth. 
By rectification, you will find the hidden stone. We've talked around that a lot, but have said hardly anything about what that means. Without claiming to offer any definitive answer, I have a suggestion. Kabbalistically, the earth is Malchut, the tenth or lowest of the Sephirot. It is said to be the seat of Keter, the first or highest of the Sephirot. And in fact, Malchut is said actually to contain Keter after another manner. This is a pair of dialectical opposites, a thesis and an antithesis, just as Bina, Babylon, and Chokhmah, Chaos, are dialectical opposites. To rectify those, we produce their synthesis, Teferit, Baphomet. So, the hidden stone that we find in the interior parts of the earth might be the Lord's secret and most holy, that is the emanation from Kether. And by rectifying, we apply the formula of vitriol, which is Baphomet. Looked at in that way, Baphomet is both the alchemical gold and the means of obtaining it. In closing, I want to leave you with one final thought about Baphomet as the unity of opposites. This is from Walt Whitman's 1892 poem, Song of Myself. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Any questions?